So Antonia, why don't you come and share with us? You know, it's funny, the first um, service that we had, I shared a verse and totally forgot why I shared that verse. And I remembered, oh yeah, I probably should explain why I shared that verse. <laughs> and so the verse that I shared, and I'll actually explain why this verse has become my new life verse, is um, uh, Luke 24, verse 5, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, why seek ye the living among the dead? And that is actually how I've begun to look at religious Judaism, is why seek the living among the dead? Obviously, in its context, it's about, you know, the woman going to the um, open tomb and not seeing Jesus, and then they're weeping, and the angels are like, why are you here? He's risen. Like, and if you look at it in kind of a, when I look at it in like a religious Jewish concept of it, actually, is if you go back to religious Judaism, you're seeking for life among dead, and you're not going to find it. Um, but to really tell about me, I grew up in actually a religious Jewish home. Um, my mother, she was a religious Jew. She raised, she tried to push that onto me. My grandparents, my cousins, my uncle. My uncle was a rabbi and a Chabad. He still is. Um, and so I grew up Jewish. I grew up a religious Jew. And for several years, I really was in love with Judaism. Being a Jew is not, to me, was more than just I'm, I'm a Hebrew Christian. No, it was, it, I'm more, more than just I'm a Hebrew. No, it was a Jew. It's a way of life. It's who you are as a person. And so through my life, you know, I, I really, I did go to synagogue. I celebrated Yom Kippur, which is atonement for our sins. You know, I did all the holidays trying to be a righteous Jew, which you cannot be. No one can ever be. And I really tried. And, you know, I did grow up in a very abusive home. And it was a very, there was never any peace in my home. There was always abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse. And this, this happened for several years, for about 14 years of my life. And like most teenagers do who are in abusive homes, I turned to alcohol, I turned to drugs, I turned to woman, I turned to anything that could satisfy, and nothing ever could. And, you know, I, as I shared before, and I, I say this because it's very true, I really just wanted to die. And every time that I would wake up, every time that I would do anything, when I would wake up, I just was angry that I was still awake. I was angry that I lived. I was angry that I had life. I, I didn't care to live. I really didn't. And, you know, to even further this anger, I joined the military. And, like, I, in my, my opinion, for me, it was a horrible decision. It made a very angry kid more angry. Um, you know, as I'm in the military, I remember just being very depressed, being very suicidal. And I even went to go speak with, I, military is actually the first time I heard the gospel, and it aggravated me. Um, because there was a Gentile guy preaching from the Ten Commandments, and I'm just sitting there like, why is this guy preaching from my book? He doesn't know anything. And I remember getting very angry about that. And I never went back to that. I was like, this Jesus thing is, is I want nothing to do with this. And I went to a uh, synagogue after that, that Friday, spoke to my rabbi saying, hey, I'm very depressed. I'm very, just feeling suicidal, and I just want to die, and Remember the rabbi there, he was just kind of like, his, I, I shared with him my childhood, the, all the abuse, and he goes, kind of, God was with you when it happened, God wanted it to happen, like God, was, God allowed it to happen because it was going to shape your life, it's going to shape who you are, if you just stick with Chabad, you stay in the synagogue, it'll all work out. Well, that night I denounced uh, religious Judaism, and I hated everything to do about God, I wanted nothing to do with God. I despise God because how can we say God is good and allow all those things to happen to me? I, I didn't, it, it did, God just was non-existent. And for many years, I sunk lower and lower into depression, just was drinking and doing random things, trying to, I guess, find peace. And then so what's funny about all this is I ended up dating a Catholic girl who was like very, like, she was an ultra Catholic, and she would tell me that I had to believe in Jesus and I'm like, no. And I go, and I, I would, I would kind of mess with her. And it's, it's, when I think about it now, it's kind of messed up. But I would say, so you want me to believe that I have to go with my prayers to some lady named Mary, who's then going to bring the prayers to some guy named Jesus who claimed to be God, but he's not good enough to be God. So then he brings it up to God. And I was like, so am I delusional or are you? And that's the biggest thing for me. Like, I'm, I'm not doing that. And she would constantly do this. And finally, I was like, enough. I'm stop. Like, and she finally stopped. 
And then, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with, there's a job out in New York, and it's to be a fire guard. And around 2019, 2017, they were paying very well. Uh, 2019, they were paying very well, actually. It was about $18 an hour, and I really wanted to get that job. And I kind of really wasn't doing anything. And so I, you have to take this test, and you're allowed to take it twice. If you fail it, the, if you fail it both times, well, you're not getting the job. That's, that's the end of that story. Uh, the first time, I failed it. The second time, you know, I'm, like, really stressed out, and I'm talking to my ex-girlfriend about this, and she's like, well, you should pray. And I'm like, yeah, I don't do that. I don't, I don't believe in prayer. And there's, there's a lot of other reasonings for that. And most of all, to pray, it's not like how we're able to do it now. We're able to sit down and actually pray to God anywhere we want. We can pray to God as we walk. No, to, as a Jew, to pray to God, you have to put on phylacteries. You have to, you know, read from a book. You have to do it a certain time and a certain day. And there's all these random things that you have to do to pray. So to me, prayer just was a whole occasion that I really want nothing to do with. And she was like, no, just, just do it. And I go, fine, I'll do it. So I sat there, and I still believe this is the day I was called to ministry. I still really believe this. And I prayed to God that day saying, you know, God, I don't know if you're there. I really don't care if you are. But if you help me pass this test, the first church I see when I get home, I'll walk into. And it's kind of funny because, and the reason why I say this the day I got called to ministry is because I would have never said church. What Jew would have said church? I would have said synagogue. I would have said, I'll go call my rabbi. And no, I said church. And I passed the exam. And I was really aggravated that I passed. I really wanted to fail. I probably did everything I could to fail. And then I, I get home right across the street from my house. Not even kidding. is a Baptist church that's been there as long as I live there. And I've never seen this building ever in my life. I had to walk past this building every day. And I don't think, when, when I explain that, when I tell you, I literally had to walk past the supermarkets on the block over there. The bus, the express bus to get to Manhattan's on the bo- is on that block over there. I, there was no reason for me to not look at this building. I looked at this building and never noticed it until the day I prayed to God. And I go up to this church, and it's Liberty View Baptist Church, and I'm like, I don't know what that means, but fine. Go in, I speak to the pastor. We spoke for about two hours. And then a few months later, you know, during this time that I was with him and he was sharing the gospel with me. And I remember one of the craziest days of my life was the day I found out Jesus wasn't Catholic. When I found out Jesus was Jewish. (laughs) Like that was the craziest day of my life. Um, I'm sitting there and he starts talking about the Passover and I looked at him, I'm like, why is Jesus celebrating the Passover? Isn't you like your Catholic guy on the cross? And I look at his cross, there's no Catholic guy on the cross, there's just an empty cross. And I was like, well, like, he's like, no, he's not Catholic. I'm like, yeah, he is. He's the Catholic guy. And he goes, have you been doing your Bible reading like I've told you to? And Julia could probably attest to this because it took me a while to read my Bible, even at Bible college in the beginning. I was like, eh, sort of. He goes, open the book of Matthew. Open the book of Matthew. And right there is just the genealogy of Christ. Everything, where he comes from, who he is, where he is. And to me, it was a realization. I remember running home and going to my mom and saying, Ma, I have a question. And she goes, what? I go, is Jesus Jewish? She goes, Yes, he's Jewish, but he said he was God, so we had to kill him. Straight like that. And I was like, all right. Like, that, I don't really care. And so a few months after that, I started seeing Jesus and Daniel when he was speaking with Gideon. Like, and these are all Christophanies. And I kept on seeing Jesus, like, everywhere. And then finally, uh, July, July 21st, 2019, I accepted Jesus during VBS over a message that had nothing to do about salvation, over a message that had nothing to do about hell. But for some reason, it just clicked. And I accepted Christ, and I got called. I fully got called to ministry. I went to a West Coast. I did transfer out. I'm going to another Bible college now to finish my degree. But that was there where I got called to reach my people with the gospel. And, you know, to even go back to that verse, why seekest the living among the dead? You know, and as I've been sharing with a few people here today, and I say this again, the God of Judaism doesn't exist. And that's something that I've had to come to terms with. There is no such thing as God of Judaism. There's a God of my forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the God of Judaism is a man-made God. And if there is a God that's actually like the God of Judaism, I want nothing to do with him because he's wicked and evil and his name is Satan. And I want nothing to do with that God. And that's why we need to reach Jewish people. And that's why, you know, I love Pastor Shane, I love Pastor Gibson and Mrs. Gibson for their heart for the Jewish people. Because they need to see that the God of Judaism is not God. He doesn't exist. And... Yeah, it's just been a weird journey, and that's why when I say 
My life verse is why I seek is the living amongst the dead. That's why I'll never return to Judaism. And I'm just very grateful to be saved. And yeah, that's the end of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. That's great. And uh, we're excited about Antonio being with us this summer. Uh, we have another intern coming. He'll be here next uh, Sunday, and uh, you'll get to meet him. And it's great when uh, God calls people to ministry and they're open about coming here to the city or to get some experience here to go wherever God calls them. So I want you to be an encouragement to these guys and pray for them. I know some of you have already been doing that, which is fantastic. And I want to encourage you to continue uh, to do that. Uh, and uh, introduce yourself to them, and they'll be with us here uh, for the next couple months, and uh, we're excited about that. Really glad to see you today, um, and uh, let me just say on behalf of my family, big thank you. Um, we enjoyed some time away. Anytime you get out of New York City, it's a good time uh, just to kind of recalibrate a little bit and spend time with family. So thank you for, for your prayers for us, and, uh, you know, we're very blessed to have so many uh, men and women who... Uh, are growing in the, in, in the word, and that can lead and, and uh, do so many things. And I know you were blessed the last few weeks. We tuned in each week as well. And I just want to say a big thank you to everybody that had a part and just kept things going. And it's a great thing. And so um, uh, I know you appreciate it uh, as well. Uh, we're going to, uh, at this time, do something that's always a privilege for us. We're going to um, dedicate some children to the Lord today. And uh, so um, we're going to do that so that way the, the, the little ones don't have to sit in the service the whole time, right? And they can go down to the nursery and they can go down with the kids' ministry. So today we have uh, three uh, children that we're going to dedicate to the Lord. So I'm going to ask those coming to go ahead and come if they would. Auxilios, Davises, uh, Makisha, if you all will come ahead and uh, come right down here. And we want to recognize uh, you all today. And it's always a special time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Come right, right here, Zane. This guy looking sharp down here today, man, he's looking good. And then we'll have you guys right over here, um, Mark and Sarah, all right? Let me read a verse here uh, today uh, from the Bible. Psalm 127, the Bible says this in verse 3. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Um, all children are a gift from God. And as moms and dads, I, I believe you understand that and know that. And we say this jokingly. Sometimes you think, I don't know if, this is, if he or she's a gift, but um, we're thankful for our kids. And uh, we're thankful for every child that God gives to us. And ultimately, they belong to him. But what a big responsibility. But what a great privilege um, that God has entrusted them to us for such a time as this. The Bible tells us as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And you get the, the picture of a guy with a bow and arrow. And we say this often, a bow and arrow, you can point it wherever you want to point it. And you can let it go and... And the reminder to parents is that we have the ability to direct and to guide our children. And so uh, today, these families, uh, these moms, these dads have come to ask us as a church to pray for them and pray with them. And uh, today we have Mike and Jimma Davis and uh, uh, their daughter, Mackenzie Joel, born April 16th, 2023. And uh, again, uh, sisters are right down front here as well. And then right next uh, to them, we have Dennis Martin. We have uh, Makisha Clark. And many of you may not know, Makisha um, um, has been coming the last month, which is great. And uh, she heard we were doing a dedication and uh, really wanted today to dedicate her daughter, Amira. And uh, we're glad uh, that she wants to do that. Amira was born February 7th, 2022. And so we're glad mom and dad are here today. And then uh, they have a lot of family in the back row back there, right? Everybody that's here with them, there they are in the back. Okay, it's great. That's me. 
let me just do this. And then we have, right here, many of you know Mark. All right. And so um, what I always tell these parents, and it's important for us to understand that this is as much a dedication for dad and mom and for family as it is for the kids. And, uh, you know, these kids are going to grow up, God willing, and, uh, um, and they're going to make some decisions later in life. But um, it's, it's hard to raise children. And uh, by uh, moms and dads being here today and family and extended brothers and sister. So they're really asking for God's help to uh, rear their children in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord, in the ways of the Lord. I'm reminded, you know, uh, in the Bible that uh, we're told to do two things as parents. One is we're to uh, help our children become conscious of God. And so as they grow older, of dad, mom, you're going to have the greatest influence in their life. And uh, to do all that you can to help uh, your daughters in these cases, uh, to know there's a God. And then not only to help them be conscious of God, but to help them to be surrendered to God. You want to teach them that the greatest thing they can do in life is to give their lives to the Lord. And uh, he made them, he created them, he has a purpose and a plan for them, and he died for them uh, so that they might be with him forever. And our prayer is that these little ones as they grow older will come to a point where they know there's a God and they'll know who he is and what he's done for them and that they put their trust in him. But we're going to also pray for you today, dads and moms. All throughout the Bible, you see parents who brought their children and asked people to pray for them. Now, this isn't a christening. Some religions christen, pour water, do some of those things, and they connect those teachings a lot of times with some magical, special, spiritual power that that saves the child's soul and all these kind of things. The Bible doesn't talk about that anywhere. That's not biblical at all. But you see in the Bible, many dads and moms brought their kids uh, to, to before the congregation, before um, uh, uh, godly men and women, before pastors and, and priests, and asked for prayer. And Jesus said, suffer the little children, let them come unto me. You think about Hannah in the Bible, even Jesus' own parents uh, took Jesus and dedicated him before the Lord. And so today we're happy to do that. And I would say to you today, um, uh, Mike and Gemma and Dennis and Makisha and, and Sarah and Mark, that, you know, today you're asking us to pray with you, that you will do all that you can do to, to rear your children according to the truth of, of, the, God, uh, of the Word of God. And uh, we want to stand behind you in doing that. And we want to pray uh, for you. We want to pray for your families who are here. And we want to pray for your kids today. And as a church, God willing, as these girls grow up, uh, we will have an opportunity to be a part of their lives. And some of you ladies have already been a part of their lives in the nursery, and some of you will have the opportunity to teach them as they grow older in class and in vacation Bible school and different things. And uh, we just should pray that God would help us to be that influence and pour into them in the right way as well today. So if you're willing to pray along with me for them, I'm going to ask you to stand with me right now. And uh, um, we're going to bow, and we're going to pray for each one of these families today, and we're going to pray for them as mom and dad. We're going to pray for these girls, and uh, I, I want you to join me as I pray today for them. Dear Lord, I thank you for these three families. We're grateful for all the families in our church. But I'm thankful today for these three, Lord, who have uh, made this decision, and in doing that, that means they understand that they need you to help them uh, in their family. And, Lord, I, I'm thankful for each of them. Lord, I'm thankful for Mike and Gemma. I'm thankful for uh, Mark and Sarah. I'm thankful, Lord, for uh, uh, Makisha and Dennis. And even though we're getting just to know them, Lord, I'm thankful for these uh, dads and moms. And no doubt they have a great desire to see the best for their children. And they understand that that's only possible through you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be with these parents and, Lord, give them wisdom Help them to know that, Lord, uh, I know they're not perfect, but help them to know that they help their children the most as they grow close to you. And I pray that you would keep them close to you. They'll follow the word, 
they'll do what you would have them to do in their homes as moms, as dads. Lord, I pray that you would help them to, to have wisdom and have patience and, and to love their kids in a way that honors and glorifies you. And Lord, help them to use every opportunity, as the scriptures say, every opportunity, Lord, whether they're walking by the way or sitting, uh, Lord, uh, that to teach and to point their children to you, who you are and how they can have a relationship with you. And so, Lord, I pray you bless. I'm thankful for the extended family, other siblings uh, uh, and uh, grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and, Lord, family who will have a part in influencing these children's lives. And I pray that you would bless them and they'll understand how important their influence is. And us as a church, Lord, help us to, to love these children, love these families, be there in prayer for them, be there to uh, support them and encourage them in their difficult times, Lord, we pray. And uh, I pray especially for these, these uh, girls. We pray for Amira. We pray for MJ. Lord, we pray for Star. We pray for these uh, young ladies. Lord, thank you for the, the blessing of life. And I pray that at an early age, they'll grow to know you, that they'll come to a place where they put their trust in you, and that, Lord, your plan, your purpose for their life will be fulfilled. That's our prayer. And so, Lord, we pray in a very great way that you would bless these families and thank you for allowing us to have a part in that. And so, Lord, we just pray that you'll continue to have your will and way in their lives. And we'll thank you for it, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen. And we're so thankful today. You may be seated. Families, uh, we have a little uh, token Bible here for you today. All right, one for Star and one for Amira and one for MJ. And it's a, a little Bible. And, uh, you know, our prayer is that uh, you read that to them as they grow older, and uh, we know that the truths of the Bible will direct and guide their life in a great, great way. And uh, that's our prayer, that you'll continue to keep God first today. And then we have a nice certificate for you. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. All right, let's give these families a big hand today, all right? God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, you may, be, you may be seated. Thank you so much. Hey, and can I just encourage you when you see them later and when you see them in the weeks to come, just tell them you're praying for them and make sure you do and, uh, and be praying for them as they're on this journey, mom and dad. Hey, we're going to uh, worship the Lord here a little bit today, and uh, we're going to stand and sing, and then I'm going to dismiss the teens. So as we stand, teens, you can be dismissed for class. Boys and girls, you can be dismissed to go downstairs for kids' church. And then parents, we have a nursery downstairs that will take care of fully staffed of your kids. If you want to let them go in a good environment and have a good time with some other kids, and you can come enjoy the service, we'll give you that opportunity today. Let's stand, and let's continue to worship. Teens, you're dismissed. Let's sing Only a Holy God and advance the slides. Thank you. To the fourth song. Wells commands all the hopes of heaven. Who else could make every Who else can whisper and darkness tremble? Only a holy God. What other
Father God, we thank you for the precious blood of Jesus, Lord, which covers us all. Lord, you have said, and you will keep your word, that you are no respecter of persons, Lord, but he that believeth in you shall be saved. We thank you, God, for the simplicity of your word, for the elegance of it, Lord, for the effectiveness of it, Lord, for the wisdom of it, for the love and mercy. Lord, we pray this day that you bless Pastor as he speaks from your word, Lord, so that we know and do the things that we ought to know and do, Lord, from your word, Lord. We thank you and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Turn to Genesis chapter 28, please. Genesis chapter 28 this morning, and we're going to uh, read there in just a moment. I want to uh, uh, encourage you to, this week to be praying for one of our missionary families, uh, the Lyons. Uh, Will and Laura Lyon are missionaries in Ecuador, uh, new missionaries. This past uh, fall, we were able to begin partnering with them, doing a great job way up in the northern Andes Mountains. And I've had a few health issues, so if you'd remember to pray with them about that, but be praying for the Lyons family this week. And I uh, hope you're praying for all of our missionaries. Pick up one of the missionary cards out there, and uh, that way you can be praying for all of them on a regular basis, and we'll certainly pray for, for them as well. How many of you have a burden, just something you're praying about that's uh, heavy on your heart? Okay, and uh, we're thankful God hears. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. I uh, appreciate Pastor Gibson last week speaking on Mother's Day, and I know it looked like it was a great service here. And uh, spoke about the importance of moms. We're going to continue the theme uh, about family uh, for the next uh, several weeks uh, because the reality, all of us are a part of some kind of family unit. Now, you may be here today and may be thinking to yourself, you know, my family, uh, um, my family status currently isn't maybe what I uh, want it to be. Uh, or maybe you would say my, my family situation uh, has seen better days. Or I'm beyond that now. I'm kind of in a different phase of life. And I understand we have grandparents here. And I understand we have young single adults here. And so 
we're kind of all in different positions, but the reality is we're all connected to someone. If you didn't learn anything last week at Mother's Day, you should have learned that um, everybody has a mother, right? And so we all have connections to people. And I think that it's imperative for us to understand that uh, all of us can always do a better job and find ways to improve our family dynamic. Is there such a thing as the perfect family? And the reality is there is not. Now, some people have kind of lofty uh, uh, aspirations, uh, kind of define the perfect family in different ways. For some, it may be uh, that, um, you know, that core family, that traditional family. If I get that, where there's a dad, a mom, and kids, and they're all in the home, then that's the perfect family. But the reality is that you can have the dad, mom, and kids in the home, and there'll be a lot of issues going on there. That there's not perfection there. Uh, Brother James sent me a statistic, actually, this week. He was listening to a radio program, and he said, did you know this? And he, he heard uh, uh, the statistic was in the United States, 18% of families would be described as traditional families. About 18% of the population would be in a father, mother, children at, in the home kind of situation. So if that is the uh, definition of perfection, then we're, we're really in trouble. Uh, some people have the idea that, hey, a perfect family is that family that is secure financially, right? Money's the answer. Money's the answer to everything. Don't people think that's the case? And the reality is sometimes a lot of families have a lot of issues because they have too much money or because money is being put places that it shouldn't be, and it becomes a dividing point. Money's not the, the uh, definition of being a perfect family, the lack of or the amount of. Some believe that it's their status, as long as socially people look at us and, and we're good and, uh, you know, my, my husband's got some achievements and, uh, you know, people think well of us in the building or in the neighborhood and, hey, my kids are in sports and they're doing well academically, that's a perfect family. Again, uh, those are all false uh, um, definitions and terms. The reality is there, there is no such thing as the perfect family. Now... Think about this with me, track just as a little bit of background. Where the family unit, where this idea of family come from, it came from God. Genesis chapter 2. So uh, God created family, and that's super important for us to understand this. Some people have had bad experiences. Some people have, have grown up in, 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 in the horrendous and fractured family kind of situations, and so therefore... Their, their response is, I don't, want to, I don't want to be attached to anybody. I don't want any, time, long, long, any kind of long-term commitments. I'm not going to go through any of that. And so they want to live a life of isolation. And, and, and that's not really uh, something that God has prescribed for everyone. God is not against family. He's for family. As a matter of fact, God created this institution called family. God created an institution called the church. God created this institution called government. But before he created the church and government, he creates this thing called the family. Genesis chapter 2. And yes, God had a diagram. God had a blueprint. He had a father, a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, children. And that was to be how it was to be. And by the way, don't you see the family is just being attacked from every direction today. And by the way, that's not anything that's new. And you say, why? Everything at its end is a spiritual battle. And so... God loves the family, Satan hates it, so he tries to shred it, and he tries to dilute it and tear it apart, and so now, you know, uh, what God has held up as being something good and something to aspire to have, it's just been ripped to shreds, and now you, you can have different dynamics, and you can have, uh, you know, uh, two men, two ladies, or in some places, you know, multiple wives, and, you know, and kids are running the house, and the parents don't have any say, and it's just all upside down all in an effort to destroy something that God created. Now, did God ever create something that was not good? The answer to that is no. So then why in the world do we struggle? Why do we struggle in our marriages? Why do we struggle raising kids? Why do we struggle relating and connecting to people who are most closely related to us? We share the same DNA, and they're the ones that are supposed to have our back and love us more than anybody. Why is it that we often struggle with them the most? Why is there no perfect family? 
Well, the simple answer is because we are sinners. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, it's one of many places where Paul would say this, he would say that there is none righteous, no, not even one. Not one person is sinless, and that's a problem. If I were to ask you today, the main source of your fights, the main source of your tension with the people that are in your family, and if you were honest about it, you'd have to go back and you'd have to admit, whether it's in their case or your case, there's pride, there's anger, there's selfishness, there's immorality, there's all kind of sinful issues at the root. And the Bible tells us we are all sinful. As a matter of fact, we're born sinful. David would say, hey, when I was born, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Meaning, I was born a sinner. I didn't become a sinner because, whoops, I did something wrong. The reality is, the moment that I, 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 I took in air into my lungs, my sin nature was on display. I was born a sinner, just like my father and mother, just like my grandparents, just like my great-grandparents. Don't we pass along a lot of family traits, right? I mean, I get my wonderful baldness from my dad and my grandfather and my great-grandfather, and I thank them over the years for that gift that they left me. But they also left me in a sin nature. And, and here's the reality, I pass that sin nature along to my children as well. And here's something, though, that you and I have to understand. That even though we're sinners and there's no such thing as the perfect husband and the perfect man and the perfect woman and the perfect wife and the perfect kid, that God still can bless my home and my family relationships. Because with God, all things are possible. Amen? And you and I do not have to do and be a, a product of what maybe was done or presented in, in front of us. Our father's past does not have to become our reality. Sometimes you see in generation after generation the same wrong behavior, the same sinful behavior, the same destructive behavior taking place. But with God, all things are possible. And God wants us to understand that. Erwin Lutzer, who was the pastor of the great Moody Church in Chicago, he's now the pastor emeritus, made this statement many years ago. We have put men on the moon but we cannot uh, find a solution for moral decay. We've made gigantic strides in medicine, but we cannot stop the alarming number of divorces and the near dissolution of the family unit. I mean, we can invent and find all kinds of things, and technology is amazing, but somehow we just cannot figure out how to fix our relationships. And families get torn apart. And we live in a society today where to see a functioning, healthy family, physically, emotionally, mentally, and yes, spiritually, it's a rare thing. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, it's too late for me, and things have already water under the bridge, and I've already made some mistakes. And look, wherever you are today, I mean, you're a part of a, of a unit, and you are connected. And you say, yeah, but they don't want me connected. I get that. But as a child of God, Christ living within you, God wants you to understand that you can be used and blessed by him to help those people who are the closest to you in your family. Many of us have unbelieving family members. Many of us have family members don't want to hear about God, don't want to talk about God. They've run away from God. And God can use us to be a light and to show the love of Christ to them. But why is that so important? And you've heard it said, as the family goes, then goes the country, then goes the community, right? Then goes the church. And I, I get it. You may say my family's dysfunctional. My family is broken and, and just divided into all kind of pieces. You might be uh, thinking to yourself, I'm alone. I have no family per se. Wherever you are, Married, divorced, young, old, with children, no children. Maybe you're on the front end. You're looking forward. You're praying, hey, God, one day I'm looking forward to having a family. Maybe you say that's all done and I can't go back and change you that, but I'm a grandparent now. Wherever it is, the reality is God wants to bless your family. So how can I have a godly family, a 
family that is at least blessed by God? How can I be that person in my family that at least has God's blessing? Well, the good thing is we, we've been given uh, a, a lot of records about families. So we're going to kind of jump in to study of family for the next few weeks. Now, last week, Pastor John mentioned Abraham's family in the book of Genesis. And so uh, you, you probably understand a little bit of background information. I mean, Abraham, God says, I'm going to bless you from you. Uh, the, there's going to be a nation that comes that's going to change history. It's going to change the world. And the Savior of the world is going to come through those people, the Jewish people. But wow, Abraham made some bad decisions. Made some good decisions, made some bad decisions. Ended up marrying a second woman, had a child with that woman. And the God says, now you got a son with another woman, but he's not the one that I'm going to pass this along to. It, it, he's not the begotten one. The begotten one is his son that's coming with your wife, Sarah. His name is Isaac. Remember, you heard Pastor John say today, the, 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 the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Isaac grows up, and there's been tension between Isaac and Ishmael, and there's still tension today. You look at the Middle East, to all the descendants of Ishmael, and, and they're against the descendants of Isaac, all fighting over rights and what belongs to us. And Abraham's our father. Technically, Abraham was both of their fathers. But to understand the promises that God made specifically for Isaac and then for Ishmael is very important. People that are fighting about all the, well, hey, you know, all of Ishmael's descendants, the Arab people, the Palestinians, they deserve, they, they've been blessed. And God has blessings for them, but not the same blessings that he gave to Isaac. It's important to understand that. Then Isaac comes along, and he gets married, and God says, hey, Isaac, through you, the Messiah is going to come. Wow, what an honor, what a privilege. I got a, this purpose, this plan. You're going to have two sons. Wow, one of, they're going to be twins. That's amazing. But here's what you need to understand. It's your second son. He's the one through whom the promise is going to go. Okay? And again, was God cruel? God... Why would he do that? Why would he skip over the first son? But God knows things we don't know. And you remember, they had two sons, Esau and Jacob. You remember that? Jacob was the second. And what we found is, boy, God really did know. God's not a good guesser. He knows everything. He knew Esau would not have a heart for him. He knew Esau would be a rebel. He knew Esau didn't want to, to do things that were spiritual. So God said, even before they were born, Jacob, Jacob's going to be the one through whom I carry out my promises. But now Isaac had some issues because as a dad, nah, he didn't like that. He didn't like how God wanted his family to go. Maybe you've been in that situation. And so Isaac likes Esau better than he likes Jacob. That's probably really not a good thing, the whole favoritism thing in a family unit. And it was known. Jacob's mom liked him more, and so now that's some strife. And so when Isaac's about to die, he calls Esau his oldest in. He says, Esau, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you all these blessings God gave me, and I've decided you're going to be the one to carry it on, even though God said that's not what should happen. Have you ever made that decision in your own mind that you're going to just do what you're going to do even though God said not to do it? It never turns out well. And you'll remember how there was some conniving and deception and mama got involved and she said, no, 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 it's not supposed to be that way. Jacob, let's go trick your father and he's blind, he can't see and Jacob acts like Esau. And so Jacob gets the blessings that God had for him but he does it in a kind of a weird and a, an untruthful way. And that just blows the top off the house. And you find in chapter 28 that Isaac finally has to accept what God wanted. And he should have done that earlier, but he didn't. And so now there's a big problem in his house because Esau hates his brother because he thinks his brother stole this from him and he wants to kill his brother. And so they got to send Jacob away. So dad says in the early part, look, all the blessings of Abraham, they go to you, Jacob, but you got to leave. You can't stay in this house. This is going to be destructive. Maybe you've been in that situation. Your brother wants to kill you. There's too much strife between mom and me, and it's just, you got to leave. You're going to, we want you to go 500 miles away, go back to where we came from, go back to the old neighborhood. He didn't know anybody, never been there before in his life. Well, what am I going to do there? Well, what, what, what's going to happen? I don't know, but you got to go. 
but God will take care of you. And that's where we pick up the scene. Notice in, in chapter 28 and verse 10, we're told Jacob leaves and he goes toward Haran. And in chapter 28, verse 11, the Bible says, and he lighted upon a certain place. I mean, he came to a certain place. And he tarried there all night because the sun was set. They didn't have any Hiltons or, you know, Ramada Inns or anything like that. So he just found a nice piece of land. And he takes the stones of that place and he puts them down as pillows to lay his head down on that place to sleep. And while he sleeps, he dreams. And behold, he sees a ladder set up on the earth, but the top of it went all the way to heaven. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending on this ladder. And behold, the Lord stood above it. God, the Lord's at the top of the ladder. And the Lord speaks to Jacob in this dream. And he says, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. And the land on where you lie, I will give it to you and to your seed. That means your children. Hey, I'm going to have children? To your children. And verse 14, your seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That sounds very familiar to the promise that he made Abraham. Verse 15. And hey, Jacob, I am with you. And I will keep thee in all the places whither thou goest. And I will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Wow, what a dream. And Jacob awoke out of his sleep. Well, have you ever had that dream you just didn't want it to end? Right? How many of us have had those dreams? We, you're scared to death, falling off a cliff, you know, uh, and you wake up and you're sweating bullets. This is a great dream. God is talking to him in this dream. And all of a sudden he wakes up, and then some realizations come to him, and he says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and he said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. I have just experienced a communication with God. This is the first time that Jacob and God have a conversation together. And can I just submit this thought to you today? For the next few weeks, we're talking about family, okay? And I, I really want to encourage you to be here every week. And I want to encourage you to, to, to have an open heart, be reading through this, okay? Invite people to come. And can I just say, this is going to sound very elementary, but I know looking out here today, I know you're just like me. And I know you have issues with people in your family. And I know that at times you're the issue because I'm the issue. And so let me just say this to you today. How do we make our families better? How do we lead families in 2024 in a way where there's hope and there's peace and there's blessing from God? And I'm going to say this to you today. It's simple, but I pray you don't miss it. The first thing that you and I have to do to help our families is to learn to communicate with God. That's it. Communication is important in any relationship. Would we agree? Matter of fact, marriage therapists tell us 67% of marriages that end in divorce, end in divorce because of a lack of communication. 1992, uh, the, the book by, written by John Gray, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Remember that book? And he was all like trying to, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, segment the differences, the sociological and psychological difference between men and women, and that's why we act the way we do, and it's almost like we speak different languages, and, and there's some merit to all of that. What was missing in that book is the spiritual aspect of that, that, hey, I can try, and I can do my best, and try to figure out, you know, what my wife's saying, and she can try to figure out what I'm saying, and I can try to understand my kids, and and, uh, and, and all the convoluted mess that maybe you have in your family, and you could try to figure that out. But here, here's the X factor, and I say that respectfully, Almighty God. With God, all things are possible. God is for your family. And God is the master communicator. How many of you believe if God wants to get you a message, he has the ability to do that? Right? So for you and for me, what needs to be a priority is that we're going to do all that we can possibly do 
to build our communication with God. I want to help my family. I need to draw closer to God. I want to help my marriage. I got to draw closer to God. I want to minister to my grandkids. I need to be closer to God. I want to help my kids who have gone astray and they don't want to listen to me anymore. I got to get closer to God. James chapter 4 and verse 8, draw nigh to God and what? He will draw nigh to you. He has always desired to have a close communion with you and me. Through nature, God has presented himself to us. Through Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh, he came to connect with us. And then God gives us this beautiful book, the Bible, to give us his word, to give us his communication. Here's the great thing. You know, in this dream that God gives to, to Jacob, there's a ladder. It's a picture of, of God coming back and forth. God is making first contact with Jacob. God is initiating communication. This is the great thing. You and I don't have to wait. Oh, God, give me a dream and just show me what you want me to do. God says, everything I need you to do, it's right here. Everything you need to know about your marriage, it's right here. You're lonely. Everything you need to understand, it's right here. You're having trouble with your kids. The information you need, it's right here. You and I need to communicate. Now, when you think about communication, it's very important that we understand what communication means. Communication is a two-way street. How many of us have been in a conversation with someone, and after an hour, you said nothing because you had not an opportunity to say anything? And after an hour, someone says, hey, how'd that conversation go? Well, I don't know, it was a conversation. It was an hour of them just blah, you know, like, you know, trying to drink out of a fire hydrant, and I didn't get to say a word. That's not really a, a, a communication. And so sometimes, even us as Christians, okay, yeah, yeah, I understand. I got to be talking to God. And so we talk to God. We talk to God a lot, and that's good. That, that's, that's vital, that's important, because there are some of us who don't do that. We'll talk to everybody in the office. We'll ask them, what do you do with your kids? And how do you handle this? And if you were in my situation with my wife, how would you handle this? And here's what I think I heard. And we talk to everybody else. Some of us will go to three, four, five different counselors and all those kind of things. Again, please understand, I'm not knocking that. But it is, it is a, a, a negative if we do all those things and God is not involved at all. The Bible says if you don't pray, you're going to faint. Just mark it down. You want something that's 100% sure? If you don't pray, you're going to fall flat on your face. So please start talking to God. But some of us, we've got that down, but we don't, we don't do the other part of communication, meaning we don't listen to him. We just talk, talk. God, you got to help my husband. God, you got to make her change. God, you got to do something with these wicked, rebellious kids. They take after their mother. You got to fix them, God. You know? And we talk, 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 talk to, to God, but we never stop and listen. We never stop and listen to God. Now, I wonder how often God's like, if you'll just be quiet and you'll let me speak, I can help you. So here's the simple message, all right? If you're about to go to sleep and you're going to listen to anything else today, I want you to catch this. Are you ready? The simple message is, that if you and I are going to communicate with God like we need to, we have to read our Bible and pray every day. You say, wow, that's so simple. I'm telling you, that will change your life and thereby change your family relationships. As a matter of fact, it's important, as we just saw today, we want moms and dads to read God's word to their kids. Why? Because they need to learn how important it is to listen to God. God has a lot to say. A lot of times we're just not listening. James chapter 1 reminds us, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. Right? It's, it's often said, God gave us two ears and one mouth. He wants us to listen twice as much as we speak. Do you listen to God? Are you looking in the world? Well, God, you, you know what's going on in my life. You know what's going on with my kids. You know what's going on with that, that brother of mine and that sister who's so hateful. You know what's going on with my marriage. God, I need, I need some instruction. And start reading, start digging in, and God will begin to speak to you. And if you and I will communicate with God, 
Our families have a chance. They have an opportunity to be blessed by God. We have to communicate with God if we're going to help our families. Some of you are just scared to death to step out and to start a family kind of thing. Because look at the world, it's crazy. A lot of our young people, I don't want to get married, I don't want to be of important. They're going to miss so many great opportunities that God has. Some of you are afraid to take next steps because of past failures. Some of you got your hands full with your kids right now and you just don't know what to do. Some of you, your marriage, you see no light at the end of the tunnel. For you, the best option is just to get out of it. And I'm telling you, grass is not greener somewhere else. You run from issues, you're going to just take them to the next relationship. Some of you have tons of regrets and you feel like it's too late for me, but you still have influence into people in your family and into their lives. But I'm saying to you, none of that, none of that will be possible. No hope and no answers if God is excluded. So it starts with your communication with God. By the way, couples come and talk, families come and talk to me, and I'm no licensed counselor, but here's what I find in the Word of God, and you've probably experienced it too. I understand you can't change people's minds, and you can't make other people do things. And for relationships to work, it takes multiple people. I get that. But here's what you can do. You can work on you. And God, you know what? I want to be close to you. I want to communicate with you. I want to be listening to you and hearing from you and taking my advice from you. And I want to be talking to you. And if you are in that position, then you let God begin to work. And God begins to work in people. They see a difference. They see things that cannot be done by man. We have to learn to communicate with God. By the way, sometimes I think in our family dynamics, our priorities are wrong. Our priority, our goal is, hey, uh, you know, we, we just want, you know, uh, everything to go great. And we, we, we just want, as I said, lots of money. And we just want, it's funny, uh, this last week in our travels, we went to a tourist place. And uh, we were standing in line. There was a whole bunch of people standing in line. And behind us, there was this young family and they had three kids, three little kids. And they just started talking to us. So we started talking to them and asking us where we're from and, what we did, and we were talking to, they were from Tennessee, and they were just talking, and so anyway, in the middle of the conversation, they're young, and she's, uh, I think she was six, she just interrupts, mister, 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 and so her mom and dad were at it, and I, I said, yes, and she says, hey, she says, you want to know what I want to be when I grow up, and I said, sure, I said, what do you want to be when you grow up, she says, I want to be rich, I was like, oh, Okay, I get it. She said, yep, I'm going to be rich when I grow up. And her mom and dad were like, oh, you know, they were just blown away. We have different priorities. And I, I, I hate to say this, but even amongst Christians sometimes, being close to God in our marriage, in our family unit, that's not our priority. Making ends meet, getting the kids through school, trying to have peace. And somehow we think all of that's possible without God. We have to learn to communicate with him. By the way, if we'll learn to communicate with him, some great things happen. I want you to see, and that's what happens here. This is Jacob's first encounter with God. And I want you to see what happens. When he begins to communicate, notice communication with God brings confirmation. We like confirmation, don't we? It's scary, being in a relationship when you first get married you realize wow two cannot live as cheaply as one when you that first baby comes along you're like whoa i come home from the hospital and this is life form in my house and i don't know if i know what i'm doing life can be fearful and trepidatious and like we need some confirmation sometime you to take that new job it looks good on paper but what if it doesn't work out well, I got an opportunity to move. Should I move? I don't know if I should move. Maybe I should. Maybe I should. I, I don't know. Confirmation's a good thing. Can I tell you where you can get your confirmation? By communicating with God. God gives Jacob the confirmation he needs. Essentially, he's been asked to leave the house. Leave the house. Your brother hates your guts and is trying to kill you. Mom and I have our own issues to work out. Sorry, but that's how it has to be. You need to go. And he goes, he's on his way, he, he by himself, and he didn't know he's going to meet and where he's going to go and how it's going to end up. And God comes to him. 
Notice verse 13. And in this dream, God confirms some things for him. He says to him, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and of God, your Isaac. Let me tell you who's talking to you right now. It's God. Hey, I'm thankful for every person uh, who has some wisdom and every person who, that loves me and wants to help me in my life. But can I tell you, nobody loves me more than God. And nobody knows what I need more than God. And so I'm a fool if I don't let God have a voice in my life. And so God says, you need to understand, you've heard all this stuff, and I know you're scared out of your mind. You need to understand that I, God, the God of your grandfather, the God of your father, and the God who's going to help you, it is I who is speaking to you. And I need you to understand that whatever's going to happen, I got you. I made your family some promises, and that included you. And he makes promises. The land, he says, where you are laying on, it's going to be yours. It's your, your land, and you may be leaving it now, but you'll be back, and I'm going to make sure you and your family get it, and your seed, yes, you're going to have kids, and you're going to have grandkids. They're going to be blessed. As a matter of fact, they're going to spread out all across this planet, and through your family, your children, all the nations of the world will be blessed. One of the reasons we celebrate and we have an honor Israel Day, it's really a recognition that God used the Jewish people to bring us the truth about Jesus Christ and they bring us the Bible. But you think about all that God has done through the Jewish people in the fields of medicine and art and science and invention, the cell phones you have in your hand in your pocket created by Jewish people. You look at all of that, all the nations of the world have been blessed that's God keeping his promise. He says, so the land and blessing, it's going to be yours. Okay, God, that's great. Thank you. You're telling me that it's all going to work out in the end. Hey, and that, that, that's a little bit of hope, but how does that help me today? I'm looking at my marriage today, and you say, one day it's all going to work out, but how's that help me today? You, you tell me that, hey, in my kid's life, Hey, there's the promise. You teach your kids. You train them up when they're young in the way they should go. When they're old, they won't depart. They'll remember it. It'll be with them, and they have every opportunity to come back. That's great. That's great. But what about now? Man, my kids are a mess, and, and they won't listen to me, and I, I, I seem to have no info. How, how does that help me now? But notice, God says to Jacob, it's going to work out, but let me also assure you of some present truths. Verse 14, uh, verse 15, and he said, I am with thee. Yeah, I made all these promises. It's going to work out. But here's, here's how it helps you today, Jacob. You are not alone. You and I should rejoice today if you know Jesus is your Savior. You are not alone. You are never alone. When you go home today, you are not alone. When you see that person that causes you such angst and it makes your blood want to boil or you talk to them on the phone or you can't even hardly mention their name because of all the past, look, guess what? You are not alone. God is with you as a believer. And he said, Jacob, you may be out here sleeping on a bunch of rocks by yourself, but you're not alone. Hebrews 13, 5, what's the promise? I will never leave thee. And I will never forsake you. I'm not going to run away from you, and I'm not going to abandon you. Some of us know what that's like. People should have had our back, people that should have loved us the most, people that we should have absolutely been able to trust in. They've abandoned us. They've run away from us. But God says, if you belong to me, I will never leave you. You may look at that relationship, and you may look at your kids and weep over them. You may look at that marriage and be like, what am I going to do? I'm just telling you right now, I don't know what the answers are. I just know that God is able to do exceeding and abundant above all that you could ever ask or think. But here's what I do know. You are not alone today. He says, Jacob, I am with you, and then I will keep you. I'll protect you. I will guard you. And we need that. Because I'm going to fly off the handle, I'm going to do something stupid, Pastor. I'm going to say something. I'm going to walk out of that house. I'm going to embarrass myself and embarrass God, but I can't take it anymore. God said, I will help you. I will be with you. I will keep you. I just got to wake up the next day and take one foot in front of the other, but I know I'm not alone, and he promised to engulf me, to protect me. 
to help me. He gives wisdom. Then he says, and I will bring you again to this land. I'll guide your steps. I will take you where you need to go. Man, how many of us have made horrible, foolish, ill-advised decisions when it comes to family? Whether we opened our mouth and let something fly, or we slammed in door and walked out, or we did something foolishly. And God, I need your help. I will direct your steps. I don't know what to say to my kids. I don't know how to make this relationship work. I will help you. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. God, I don't know, should I do that? Should I not do that? I need God's help. I can't do it on my own. Jacob, you cannot do this on your own, but you don't need to do it on your own. Hey, I've got a plan, I've got a purpose. If you trust me, I'll take care of it. It's gonna work out, but I want you to know in the journey, and yeah, I know it's rough, but you're never alone, and I can be there to help you, and I can be there to guide you in your life. Man, how assuring is that? But I don't know those things if I'm never listening to him. If I'm just talking, 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 or I'm not even, I'm, I'm just doing whatever. I'm looking around. Well, situation looks bad. Everybody's telling me I should leave. Everybody should say I should just walk out on this guy. Everybody should, I just should give up hope. And I'm just listening to everybody else. And I'm not listening to God. I don't know these promises. I'm, I don't have these assurances to lift my spirit. That's why communicating with God is key to helping your family. When I communicate with God, it brings me confirmation. Secondly, it brings me evaluation. When you start listening to God, now all of a sudden, God starts speaking, and now you've got some homework. All of a sudden, you start realizing, uh-oh, you know, I never knew that. I never thought about that. I, I need to stop and pause and think about this a little bit. The Bible tells us that when Jacob had this dream, when he awakened, verse 16, he, he all of a sudden had a different mindset. And first of all, he realized he was ignorant. Wow, there's some things happening and I never knew it. God has been here the whole time. God's been with me the whole, God's right here in this place with a bunch of rocks and I didn't even know it. You said sometimes we feel like we're so alone, nobody understands, nobody's going through what I'm going through, nobody has it as bad as I, the, the, the abuse and the hardship, and I get it, and, and we're not condoning any of that. It's all bad, but what you have to understand is that there's nothing new under the sun, but here's what you also need to understand as a believer, that you are not alone. But many times we don't see that God is right there because we're so focused on everything else. We're not getting our way. We don't see the change as fast as we want. It's not happening the way we wanted it to happen. We don't see God. Jacob says, how did I, not, how, how did I miss that God has been looking over me this whole time? By the way, there's a reason why the Bible says in everything to give thanks. You may say, well, if you knew my husband, you'd know there's nothing to be thankful for. I promise you that there's somebody out there who's got a worse husband than you. But can I encourage you to understand there's always something to be thankful for? And if you're in the word, and yeah, you're talking to God, but you're letting him talk to you and you're listening, he opens your eyes and he reminds you, you're right, God, you're right. Also, he realized how insufficient he was because then he was afraid. I mean, God has had this plan for me the whole time. God's been with me the whole time. How did I not see this? And wow, I've really done some dumb things and I made some big mistakes and what if I misstep? And he begins to realize how frail he is. When, when you begin to listen to God, hey, he loves you too much to, to not pull punches. He is going to tell you the truth. And how many of you know that it's the truth that, that makes you free, right? And he's going to say, hey, you're culpable in this too. you got a fat mouth and you won't shut it up. So work on yourself. Or you're full of yourself and you're arrogant and you're selfish. Oh, you're right, God. You're right. You're right. 
Isn't it amazing? We can point out everybody else's faults, but many times we can't see our own. Well, God knows. And if we'll give him a voice, he'll tell us because we need to hear it so we can heal, so we can be healthy, so that our marriages, our kids, our families can be the best unit that they can possibly be before God. He was afraid, and he says, oh, man, this is like, this is a dreadful, I don't know, if, this is like the house of God. He eventually names this little piece of land Bethel or the house of God because that's where he had his first experience with God. As a matter of fact, years and years and years later, he's an older man. He's married. He's got kids and grandkids. God follows through on his promise, and he brings Jacob back. And as he's coming back home, he says, stop. Genesis 31, verse 13, you stop, and I want you to stop at Bethel. You know, the place where we first had our conversations, where we first had communication, and where you bowed down and you worshiped me, and you listened to me, and I want you to go back there, and I want you to remember that. Many, 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 many times in your life, in your marriage, in your parenting, you and I need to be reminded, look, I have to get close to God. I have to keep communicating with God. Have I stopped that? When I communicate, it brings me confirmation of some things. It helps me to evaluate some things. And lastly, it brings motivation. He doesn't go back to sleep. He doesn't say, oh, that's great. Let me go back. He's ready to do something now different. I'm ready. I'm ready to get up. I'm ready to go. As a matter of fact, he takes these pillows. And instead of now slumbering, and, and just wasting time, he builds an altar, he pours some oil, he worships God. And then he makes a commitment to God. It's a good thing to make some commitments to God. Now, granted, God said, don't make me a promise if you don't intend to keep it. Because God has every intention of holding us to that promise. Because God keeps his promises. Here's what Jacob said, verse 20, Jacob vowed a vow saying, God, if you'll be with me, you'll keep with me, you'll keep helping me, you'll keep me in this way, you'll give me that bread and those clothes, and you'll keep guiding me, and you'll bring me one day back to my father's house, you'll keep directing me, then here's what I want you to know, verse 21, the Lord shall be my God. Then you have my trust completely. I will not trust in anybody else. I will not trust in anything else. Why would I? God, I will look to you. I will follow you. I will worship you. This stone I will set for a pillar. This is God's house. And by the way, in verse 22, and all that you give me, I'll give a tenth unto thee. Hey, I'm all in, God. I'll, I'll, I'll be the man you want me to be. Uh, I'll lead a family that you give me. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I, 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 I'll personally do what you want me to do. I'll give you all my resources. You know, tithing wasn't even a thing back then. But I'll just give you what I got. It'll all be yours, God. If you're really with me and you're not going to leave me and you're going to help me and your word is true and if this all is, is, is a fact, then I'm in. And you see that God's promise, his plan to work through Jacob and through the family of Jacob is accomplished. It, when we spend time with God, it motivates us to follow him. It motivates us not to quit. It motivates us to keep doing what we need to do, to be the husband, to be the, the wife, to be the father, to be the mother, to be the brother, to be the sister, to be the kid, to be what God wants us to be. Every day God gives me breath, there's a purpose for it. There's a plan. And I may have checked out, but I don't need to check out anymore. If I know that God is in charge of things, then I'm gonna attach myself to him. And I know that if I do that, I will never have regrets. Look, like all communication, it takes time and effort. Any good relationship takes a lot of work. If you are communicating with God in a deep and personal way, it's not by accident. 
It's because you work at it. You shut the television off. You get off your phone. You go somewhere. You give time to it, even if you don't feel like it. You let God speak to you. You, you get rid of the distractions. You listen. You, you take a note. You process. You put it into practice. You work at it. And then you pour out your soul to God. But if he knows you've been listening to him, how much more will he listen to you? Right? Don't we do that? Don't, don't we live that every day? Aren't there people in your life when you see them coming, you know, oh, they're just going to ask me for something. You know, they have no other desire to talk to you. They don't want to listen to you. They don't care what you can do for them or, or how you can better their lives. Just give them what they want. That's the only reason they're coming to you. You feel used. How must God feel so many times? God, you got to help me with my relationship. But I'm not listening to him. I have no desire to listen to him. Wouldn't it be better if we're communicating? All communication takes time, so don't give up. And understand this principle. Your family relationships will only get better as your spiritual relationship with God gets better. That's it. It's not rocket science. If this gets stronger, this will get stronger. That's it. I don't know how to fix this. Then work on this. And if you work on this, now... You and him can work on this. And isn't that the answer? So as we think about our families today, understand God wants that deep communication with you, with me. So ask yourself, am I listening to him? Am I reading my Bible? And then am I praying? And if I'll do that, it'll benefit me and it'll benefit those around me whom I love. And if you're here today and you don't have that relationship with God, there's only one way to have that relationship with God. You only get to communicate with God through Jesus. See, God took the first step. We could not communicate with him. So Jesus left heaven. He was that ladder. He came here so that we could have a relationship. He died for our sins so that we could be forgiven and cleansed, so that we could now have access to God. If you've never made that decision to say, Jesus, I put my trust in you, be my savior. You're the only way to heaven. Not the church, not some people I may or may not know. Only you, Jesus. Nobody died for me like you did. He was buried, he rose again. Bible says that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now you shall be saved. He's the mediator between God and man. If you've never made that decision, I pray you will. We'd love to talk with you about that today so that you can enter into a relationship with Almighty God. I pray you'll give us that opportunity. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Can we do that today? Heads are bowed. Nobody's going to uh, publicly embarrass you. Nobody's going to uh, do anything like that today. But before uh, we have this invitation before we pray and close out our service, I wonder if there's anybody here today and you would say, hey, pastor, the reality is I don't have that relationship with God. I, I, I don't talk to God. I don't know how to talk to God. As a matter of fact, I've never put my trust in Jesus. I didn't know he was the, the difference maker. I, I have questions about that. I'd like to put my trust in Christ. Pastor, would you just pray for me? If that's your story, would you just put a hand up, put it right back down just so I can see it? And I'll pray for you in my heart. Is there anybody like that? Pray for me, Pastor. Boy, today, if you've never made that decision, even where you sit, you can pray and just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I can't get to heaven. I can't have a relationship with you, but you came to me. Thank you for dying for me, for being buried, for rising again. Be my Savior. He'll hear that prayer. He'll save your soul. He'll put you in his family. Now you have a relationship with him. In a moment, we're going to stand and, and uh, we're going to just take a moment, of just kind of quietness, reflection, ask you to search your heart. 
where you stand, where you sit, or if you want to come and pray here at the front, maybe you need to talk to somebody, maybe you need to pray with somebody. That's what the invitation is for. It's for you to have an opportunity to respond to God's leading in your life. Don't reject him today. We want to give you that opportunity. If you have questions, we'd love to talk with you about it. And then to my brothers and sisters, those who are believers in Christ, I know life is difficult and family, you love them sometimes and sometimes, oof, they're the worst. Maybe you've given up on some relationships. Maybe you stopped praying. Maybe you've just gotten overwhelmed. So ask yourself this question, am I communicating with God as I should? Am I improving on that? There's something that I can always improve on in my relationship with God because the stronger that gets, then the stronger my family can get. Today, if God's speaking in your heart, you just pray, you talk to God and make those decisions he would have you to make. Let's stand today. Can we do that with heads bowed? Adam's playing. If you need to come, you come. Heads are bowed. As you pray, just take a moment. Search your heart today before we close. Lord, thank you so much today for your word. Thank you that we have families in the Bible that we can learn from. And uh, Lord, we realize as we start reading about these families that our families aren't so much different. That there's a lot of commonalities. Lord, as we read, we also begin to see how you can do great things in and through our relationships if we'll listen to you. Lord, help us to learn to put a priority on our communication with you. Lord, yes, we need to pray, and we need to pray specifically, and we need to pray regularly, and, and so help us to do that, and I'm thankful you invite us to do that. Many of us have turned to other options to try to find answers, and we just haven't talked to you about it. So forgive us for that, Lord, and help us to pray for our families. But Lord, help us to also seek your word, your instruction, your guidance, your truth. Forgive us that we often just kind of breeze past that. What do you want us to do in our marriages? What do you want us to do in our parenting? How do you want us to live our single lives? What is your desire for us? So, Lord, help us to be listeners. Help us to be doers of your word. I pray for everyone here. A lot of hands were raised earlier. People have burdens and needs, and I know some of those are connected with people we love. Help us to be the light. Help us, Lord, in our family of unperfect people to be able to reveal to people that don't know you that even unperfect people, when they give their lives to Christ, can be different. And so, Lord, I pray that you would work in our homes and in our families for your honor and for your glory. Help us to take hope today. Encourage husbands and wives. Encourage parents, Lord. Encourage kids, we pray. So as we dismiss today, Lord, please send us home with your blessing. Lord, use us this week for your honor and for your glory. Lord, we love you, and we want to say thank you for all you do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Hey, we do love you. So glad that you're here today. Can you do this on your way out? Um, if you're coming to the discipler um, workshop, look, we need people to help mentor other people in our church. So if you're willing to do that, come this Saturday.
10 o'clock. Please sign up. We need to get an idea of how many might be coming. And uh, if you're not sure, come, and you can hear what it's about, and uh, God will direct it from there. Sign up. Next Sunday, come for service, Memorial Day weekend. If you're in town, we're going to pray for our country, pray for our troops, and then we'll all celebrate with a barbecue afterward, okay? God bless you. Thanks for being here today. If you're visiting, stop at the Welcome Center. Have a great day.